<laughs> Wait, I have to check my mic. <laughs> it's on, yes? Oh, I'm being, I think I'm being broadcast, okay. All right, well, I'm gonna get out, come out here and sit all by myself, so. <laughs> Uh, welcome to All Space Considered at Griffith Observatory. How many of you have never been to an All Space Considered? Oh, that's kind of surprising. He's lying over there. Um, how many of you have been to an All Space Considered? Okay, there you go. And for those of you who have never been, how many uh, came because a friend brought you? Okay, that's a, the majority. How many of you saw it in a newspaper, in print, ink? Yeah, I think he's not telling the truth either. We have a lot of liars here today. How many of you uh, just saw the line and got in it? Okay. And uh, how many of you saw it on a website, any website? All right. So, you know, we try to see what's true so we can see how we reach people best. Uh, so thank you for however, whatever brought you here. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Dr. Laura Danley. I'm the curator of Griffith Observatory, and I am your host tonight. And usually I have with me a few other people, but uh, we're going to bring them up a little bit later in the program just because there were just too many chairs up here and we got too crowded. <laughs> so it's a little lonely for me, but uh, I'll start by, uh, by uh, first of all, thanking the taxpaying citizens of Los Angeles. How many of you are taxpaying citizens of Los Angeles? You may not know it, but Griffith Observatory is your municipal observatory. It is uh, owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks. So there aren't a lot of cities in the world that have their own municipal observatory. Just Springfield in The Simpsons has. <laughs> Springfield Observatory looks a lot like Griffith Observatory. Um, but uh, you know, for the most part, it, it's a pretty rare thing. So you know, Los Angeles rocks and rules, and it's the best. And so yay, and hooray for Hollywood, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so what? Duck. <laughs> You're prescient, I think, over there, um, and you'll see what I mean. Um, and uh, uh, how many of you are members of Friends of the Observatory? Oh, I love that. Yay, Friends of the Observatory is our sister 501c3 membership and fundraising organization. It sponsors our school field trip program, so if you like fifth graders and you think they should you know, know a little bit more science, you might want to consider uh, joining Friends of the Observatory. It also supports things like all the great equipment in here, uh, our new production for our upcoming planetarium show. Uh, you know, they do uh, so much for us, and you would be so uh, appreciated if you considered joining if you don't, uh, aren't a member already. So uh, we did reference the music a minute ago, and we have a little game that we play when we listen to the music. So, Bill, do you want to tell us what that's all about? You turned it off. Testing, testing, yes. All right. So, um, yeah. Hi. So uh, we have a game we play. You heard music playing when you came into the theater. Uh, each one of those pieces of music is in some way connected to a title or theme or something in one of the stories. And it is OK when that story comes up, if you remember the connection, to shout out the name of the piece of music or some description of it if you don't know the exact title. And if you do that, and you're the first to do that, then you get a prize. And the prizes are really awesome. We have all kinds of pictures of space, all kinds of stickers from various missions, including Cassini and, and all sorts of things, W first. We also have these new uh, stickers, if you're into stickers. We have uh, these stickers that came from JPL, correct? Caltech. Uh, Caltech, I'm sorry, Caltech. Well, they're so closely associated. <laughs> Caltech. And uh, they, uh, each, each sheet has all of the, the sun and all the planets and various other uh, solar system objects. <coughs> I do like to point out they're going fast. The outdated calendars are almost gone. We, uh, we have uh, only two left for 2016, which will be good again, exactly again in 2044. So the idea is you stick this in your sock drawer, forget about it. You just put a little reminder in December, you know, late December 2043 to uh, pull it out of your sock drawer. And then you have a nice calendar that's got Griffith all over it. The antenna balls. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, it sounds like we still have a couple of antenna balls from JPL, but I'm wrong. It's empty. Sorry about that. <laughs> Nobody has a car Jeez. antenna anymore anyway. Um, finally, we have bookmarks, and as I like to say, if you're under the age of, I don't know, 25, you can Google what a book is, and then you understand what this is for. 
Everybody groans. I don't mean it. You don't have to Google it. You can Yahoo it or Bing it or anything you want. All right, I think that's it. So guess away and enjoy the show. Okay, so uh, indeed, here you are at All Space Considered. Those are ways to learn more about us or get in touch with us. Um, so it is the first Friday of every month. So if this is your first time, come back on the first Friday of any month, and we're usually here doing this show. Uh, tonight is February 2nd. Happy Groundhog Day, Hog Day everyone. And uh, so we will be talking a little bit about the lunar eclipse. We have a special guest tonight uh, who is going to, as you can see, take up most of the first half, which is why we're not all up here at once. Uh, and I will tell you more about him and about that. As he... How many of you have already bought a book? Oh, go buy a book. We're, uh, uh, Clifford uh, Johnson is going to be telling us about his new book, The Dialogues, which is beautiful. And I'm going to give a sneak pre preview because, oh, of course, I got the one white page with text on it. <laughs> right? It's like a graphic novel style. How is that for an exciting physics book? Uh, so he's going to be telling us more about that um, and uh, doing a book signing both at intermission and uh, after the show. And then, uh, as always, the uh, sky report for the coming month so we can, you can anticipate and see what's in the sky. Then we will show some pretty pictures, take a break. Break is going to be a little extra long this time, 15 minutes instead of 10 just so you can uh, go buy a book. And uh, Clifford will be available <laughs> to uh, sign them. Um, and so I know you will want to do that after you have met him and heard him tell us a little bit about, uh, about his book. Um, then in the second half, we have a number of stories here. Uh, Detroit is Meteor City. Uh, Holy Hypatia, what in the world is that? Uh, something's fishy in the river, a snowball's chance in the Sahara. Stories from the Red Planet, Tight, I love this one, Tian Gone Soon. If you don't know what that means, you will. Uh, Tesla Delivery Test, and uh, Fourth and AAS. Uh, you don't know what that means, but you will again. And Remembering Thomas Bopp and John Young, both of whom passed away in this past month. Um, so without any further ado, I think I've, oh, right. Safety. Safety, yeah. <laughs> If you need to leave, don't go there because you'll end up in a closet. And then um, it doesn't lock behind you, so that's good news. But still, you'd have to come out and go up the stairs and look sheepish, and everyone will make fun of you. If we do, if you, we do have an emergency, I will lead you out that way. Uh, that's an emergency exit. So if you must leave, you go out the back. But as you can see, we do take a break. So you know it's better to wait to, for break because <laughs> you don't want to crawl over everybody. These are not the best seats for that. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have to start with that. Happy Groundhog Day. And uh, Sarah found this at the, on the Onion. We thought it was kind of fun. This poor depressed groundhog <laughs> shadow who he once was. Um, but it's been an extraordinary week for astronomy. And by the way, uh, Groundhog's Day, uh, is it Groundhogs or Groundhog? I thought it was just one Groundhog. Um, pucks the did anybody know? Did he see a shadow? Yes. yes. Oh, darn. Well, guess what? It is six, day, six more weeks because uh, this is the midpoint between the first day of winter and the first day of spring. So this is actually ruled by the calendar and by the movement of the sun around, uh, uh, around the earth, around the sun. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, you're in the right place. Uh, so, uh, so it actually has astronomical origins, believe it or not. Um, and of course, also this week, we had this breathtaking uh, eclipse. How many of you saw it with your own very eyes? Yes, isn't that breathtaking? How many of you saw it on our live stream? How many of you woke up just in time to see it on our live stream? Uh, so of course, it got a lot of uh, play as the super blue blood moon. So what is that all about? Super was because it was kind of close to Earth. It's actually not at its perigee, which is the word when it's as close as it can get. It was a day off. Um, it wasn't anywhere near as close as the perigee supermoon in, on January 1st. But nonetheless, it was pretty close, and so it was big, and that made it even more exciting because the closer something is, the bigger it appears. It was blue because it was the second full moon of the month, and uh, that goes these days by the nickname Blue Moon. That's actually evolved over time. This usage of the term Blue Moon has really only been around for about 40 years. It has an earlier history that I won't uh, go into now, but that's what people were talking about. Just the second full moon of the month. Um, there's no full moon in February, so I don't know what you call that, a negative moon or something. 
Um, and then blood moon, of course, because it was an eclipse. So the last time there was a total eclipse at, uh, <coughs> at, the, um, at perigee, right? No, uh, what? The blue moon, right. The last time there was a, a blue moon, second in the month, in uh, uh, eclipse was in 1866. So you might remember uh, we had a slide last time of all the things that was happening uh, in, in the 74. This is what was going on in 1866. Uh, the nickel was newly minted. That was kind of exciting. Jesse James, uh, I think, robbed his first bank. Um, anyway, you can see the stars in the, in the flag. It was quite a while ago. So yeah, a lot of time has passed. Um, and uh, so it was a beautiful show and I hope you enjoyed it. We had an event up here. It was very busy, as you can see, a lot of people in the middle of the night. Uh, we had our director in his usual wizard costume, you know, <laughs> beseeching the moon to return since it's disappeared. Uh, we had, uh, we watched it and viewed it and recorded it through our own uh, telescope that's in the Zeiss, historic Zeiss telescope dome. And uh, so we have a couple of pictures. There's our telescope looking at the moon, kind of cool. Um, and uh, just a beautiful picture by one of our guides. Um, and here is our, the whole thing in 60 seconds. So if you missed it, here you go. Um, the, it started out with a penumbral eclipse, without, uh, which is very hard to see at first. But slowly and surely, you start to see that the side of the moon gets darker and darker. And then uh, the first bite is taken out of the full umbral eclipse, they call it and uh, more and more of the moon disappears. Those, that's us changing the exposure level. It's not going backwards, but uh, the, the thinner the sliver, the more you have to open up the uh, aperture. And then, of course, when it was completely in eclipse, it had this absolutely breathtaking, deep, deep copper hue. It was darker than most that I've seen in, in quite a while. So uh, then after uh, over an hour of that, slowly but surely the moon did come back. So our director was successful in getting it to come back. <laughs> and then the sun ro rose, and I particularly love this. We got to see it all the way go into the set. So, uh, so we're pretty excited about that. A lot of people saw our show. Uh, over a million people um, watched it uh, real time. This is on our, that was our YouTube channel. Livestream had another 100,000. And uh, as you can see, a lot of people have seen our sped up vision too. So we're pretty excited about that and we were thrilled to be able to bring it. And again, if you're a member of Friends of the Observatory, that camera that we used that gave us this breathtaking image was uh, purchased with Friends of the Observatory funds. So you made that possible. Here's a lovely uh, moonset image taken by Sarah here. And then after all of us had been up all night doing our webcast, there we are looking happy and exhausted. Um, so, uh, Normally in fe February, we try to tell you about all the exciting stories in the American Astronomical Society meeting. That's the Professional Society of Astronomers, and uh, they it's sometimes referred to even by the press office itself as the Super Bowl of Astronomy. So last year, last month, uh, we showed this because the AAS, as we call it, was just about to start, and we said in February, we are going to bring you um, all of the exciting headlines and stories of the AAS. And of course, uh, several uh, teams are no longer in the running, so we had prepared this wonderful graphic uh, to uh, talk about the, um, the uh, Super Bowl of astronomy. But um, then uh, we discovered that we had a <laughs> Wow, that was loud. Let me, let me just do that a little bit. Oh. Can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, while we have a moment, while he's fixing, let me say I forgot to say hello, live stream audience. I meant to say that we're live streaming this evening, so um, you're all like, well, you're all in the darkness. They can't see you anyway. But uh, anyway, um, so sorry if I just blew out your ears at home. Um, so I've turned it down. We're going to do the same way. Anyway, uh, so uh, because we have a guest this uh, this evening, we have decided to punt. <laughs> Oh, he missed it out of his hand, and then he... <laughs> oh, yeah, we have, we're punting on the AAS stories. 
and instead we're going to do them next month. But because this is, um, uh, you know, the Super Bowl is just a few days away, a few days after next month's show is none other than uh, the Oscars. So well, rather than do a football themed, we thought we would do the Golden Griffith Awards. And if you are here in the second half, Okay, um, you will be like the America, the foreign press or the academy or whoever it is uh, and get to vote on what stories you'd like us to cover. So in the second half we're going to do a little quick run through of what the nominees are and then you will vote for us and we'll collect your ballots. You'll get the ballots at the second half and uh, those are the stories we'll cover for you next month. All right. So, without any further ado, I, well, there was a lot of ado in there, so, um, so let me uh, welcome to the stage uh, Clifford Johnson, author of The Dialogue. So, <laughs> Clifford. How many of you have seen Clifford here before? Or seen him anywhere before, let's put it that way. <laughs> there you go. Clifford is a oh, friend yeah. of the show. He's been on our show before. Um, he's a professor at the University of Southern California and uh, a, a Maxwell Award winning physicist and, uh, and popularizer. He's written books and been in TV shows and very passionate about making sure that people have the opportunity to learn a little bit more about astronomy. So um, I've had a chance to look at this pretty amazing book. Uh, it's, there is a lot in here. It's deceptively dense, um, and, uh, and in a good way. In a good way, yeah. No, no. I mean, <laughs> of course, of course, a good way. What could not be good about something that looks, you know, like this? This is just incredibly fun to to read through. So, um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the book? Uh, and okay, we'll I'm switch not over. Sure, if my microphone is on, but uh, it is. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me. Uh, if you can see this. There you go. Yes, you can. Um, uh, this is going to be brief, maybe five or six minutes. It's sort of um, a little bit of the sort of whys and wherefore, uh, wherefores of this, of this whole project. So what I, what I have up there is, is uh, a slide showing a book. And books are awesome things, as I think we all agree. And uh, in view of what I'm about to say, it's actually uh, just a, a couple of pages from a book of mine so that I'm not disparaging to anyone else's book. But <laughs> the point is, is that I, uh, I think there's much more we can do, uh, especially when we're talking about getting people engaged in the excitement that is, that is science and scientific ideas. There's much more we can do than just prose books. Prose books are wonderful. And there's a certain kind of book that um, someone in my position as an academic who does research, who likes to engage with the general public. There's a certain kind of book that, that, that we're sort of supposed to write, as it were. And for years, people asked me, you know, when am I going to write that book? And it just didn't feel urgent to me. Uh, uh, not because there aren't, uh, you know, the whole enterprise isn't a great thing. It's just because I, I really wanted to try and do um, uh, something that would maybe uh, broaden the kinds of uh, ways we have to talk about physics in book form, and maybe also then broaden the audience as well. I think there's many different modes of, of, of learning that people have, and not everyone wants the sort of typical book, which is sort of you know, the voice of the expert telling you uh, what you're supposed to think about you know, whatever the latest topics are. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but not everyone likes that. Some people say it reminds them too much of being in school or it's too much like a lecture. So, so the idea was to try and do something different. Um, but I, 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 I didn't really uh, uh, land on the, the actual sort of answer to what I was looking for in terms of what the project would be for a long time. I had the idea then about 18 years ago, actually, oh that um, there is something that's very singularly missing from a lot of the, the literature, uh, uh, you know, the books that we academics write, and, and, and that's a science book that, that, that uh, is more about conversations about science, and more about inviting people to have conversations about science, making everyone feel like they're part of this piece of our culture, as, as, as which science is, 
um, uh, and you know everything else, every other aspect of culture, we talk about it, right? We have conversations about it over dinner and things like that, uh, in cafes and so on and so forth. And that is not actually celebrated in book form anywhere that I could see. And it occurred to me that it would be great to have a book of dialogues, conversations about science. So that was the, that was the birth of the idea of the dialogues. Um, but still, it, uh, many years went by. I was working on other things. Research was very exciting in my field, so I was distracted by that. And then I realized, actually, that one of the components of the idea that was most important was the visual idea. I thought, in, in addition to uh, inviting you to, to, if you like, eavesdrop on a conversation about science or conversations about science in general, um, wouldn't it be nice to see some of the, the products of that conversation? Usually when people sit and they're having a, an in-depth conversation about something, they might even sort of scribble and doodle a little bit. Uh, and, and sometimes that can look quite beautiful. It's quite interesting what, what, what the sort of conversation, uh, the fragments of the conversation on the page. So I thought that would be an interesting thing to show. So the original idea was that I would do those conversations, but still, it was still largely a prose book with some illustration. And then I thought actually it'd be fun to, 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 to not just do that, but maybe also to sort of uh, see some of the diagrams that we draw when we're trying to explain certain concepts, break that rule that we're, we're we, we're, that's supposed to be out there, that you're not supposed to show equations in, in popular science books. I wanted to go, no, no, we can do that as long as we actually um, uh, you know, don't try and uh, expect everyone to get everything out of it. You, you, you can look at it and you can get what you can and uh, maybe talk around it in certain ways and treat it, it almost like a piece of art where you, you, know, you look at a painting, you don't get everything about the painting, but you don't run screaming because it's you know, <laughs> art. Uh, I don't understand the history of art. I can't look at this painting. You, 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 you know, so treat, treat equations uh, the same way. Um, they're the important tools that we use in science. Um, why do we not show those? Uh, when we're talking about how we got our ideas. Um, so um, so uh, that was one of the things. But then show the people. So I thought, actually, it'd be fun to show the people. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting also to show where the people are? Because that would also drive from the idea that science isn't just taking place in special centers with you know, labs or in special conference centers. It's out there in the world. It belongs to everybody. So that was the idea. So why not show the world? So I got a little carried away. <laughs> and I started showing the world. And I got even more carried away. And uh, yeah, so, so I realized at some point I was doing something very different from the usual kind of book. And in some ways, the, the images, the things I wanted to show, sort of ate the prose, as it were. Uh, and that became the book. It was visual. Um, and then I realized, oh, my goodness, it's a graphic novel. It's a graphic uh, kind, a graphic uh, novel style book nonfiction, science, um, and uh, you're actually then really looking over the shoulder and almost being part of these conversations. It's an invitation uh, to have conversations of your own about science, explore all kinds of ideas, and also it's a, it's a, it's a celebration of those conversations, which really do go on out there in the world. I'm sure uh, many of you have been involved in such conversations. So that was the idea, and so uh, I, oops, do I go back? Can I go back? Yeah. And so I um, uh, made the book. Um, <laughs> so I'm cutting out this long story of teaching myself how to draw and stuff like that so I could do it. Um, but um, that, was the, that was the core idea. I'm going to say one last thing and yes. then stop I, rambling I, on. Yeah, no, I already have <laughs> five questions for you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say one last thing, which is that um, uh, once I got to this point, I realized it gave me this huge freedom to do things that you normally don't get to do in these kinds of books. So yes, I can show uh, what's going on. Uh, I, can, I can show those kinds of scribblings that you either do uh, professionally or otherwise. Um, I can show some of the tools of uh, the trade. I can show these things. Some of you might know what that middle thing is. It's actually a Feynman diagram. And it's, it is actually one of the most powerful calculational tools in the history of science. Um, and uh, I can show that, and I can actually show something very interesting, which it actually is very much, in the, not just in the spirit of cartoons, it actually is a cartoon. And I've draped some panels over it to show that you can read it like a comic uh, <laughs> and actually get the physics of what's going on out of that in a way that actually the professionals really do. And so it sort of belongs 
uh, in this context. And then I can also, in, 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 in addition to showing people talking about the science uh, or showing the science in some sort of abstract sense, I can show the people engaging with it. You know, the, this, this, this character is splashing some water. There's a discussion about the nature of space and time and the nature of water and a connection between those two, which I won't go in now, into now. But I can really do that. You know, instead of just words, this is the kind of thing you can do. So that was the idea. And then finally, I discovered a new equation, <laughs> which is that comics <laughs> actually um, are physics. Uh, and uh, let me explain that, and then uh, you'll, you, I think you'll see what I mean. It's, there's a serious point. And that is what you do when you uh, read a comic. And it, it's, it's this amazing medium. When you read a graphic novel or comic, depending on how sophisticated you want to be, you can use either term, uh, or sequential narrative art, if you want to impress, <laughs> if you want to impress your friends. Uh, um, uh, you're actually very engaged in the business of, of uh, you, you're part of the special effects, your brain, in the following sense. Um, you lay together a series of images and there's a convention about how we read them. For example, we read them left to right, and your brain is already moving that character. For example, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, sequence here, you're moving that character through space and time. You're creating space. You're creating time actively as a reader. And you can do it at whatever pace you want. So it's very different from a movie or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or an animated short or what have you, which are also great forms. But people also often think graphic novels are just you know, a bunch of stills and ultimately someone will glue them together and make a cartoon. No, it's a very, very different uh, medium that in which you are very heavily engaged. But then the other thing that's kind of interesting is that you're creating space and time, and that's physics. So perhaps more than any other um, science, I would say that physics and comics are extremely well suited to each other. It is the medium in which you can really play with uh, the whole business of talking about space and time uh, in a way that happens in the structure of how you actually lay out the page. And so I actually play with that a little bit. I talk about, for example, uh, you know, the breakdown of space and time that is uh, expected to happen uh, uh, at the beginning of the universe, at the Big Bang, or perhaps deep inside a black hole. And while they're talking about it, I actually dissolve the panels. And sort of, so that the space that is the, 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 the core of what the graphic novel is itself is, is dissolving. Or uh, I can actually talk about, uh, these two characters are talking about what may or may not go on in the interior of a black hole. And uh, one of the things we understand, at least from classical gravity, from Einstein's general relativity, is that space and time begin to get sort of distorted and warped in a certain way as you go into the interior. They get, uh, things become counterintuitive. And so the order in which you read the panels, I mess up that order so that uh -huh. you're, you're kind of confused in the way you read it. Uh, and that dissonance is, 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 is intended to <laughs> get across. <laughs> That's space and time there you dissolving, go. yeah. Yeah. See? I, there, yeah, there's sound in this graphic novel. No, no. Yeah. no, no. I really wonder. <laughs> I shouldn't overpromise. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I get to really play with several levels of, of, of narrative here, including the layout of the page, uh, which is the space and time, the graphic novel, interacting with the space and time that's being discussed uh, by the characters. Anyway, that's probably enough. Uh, I'll shut up now. Oh, I have <laughs> several questions, and then I know others have questions as well. The first thing, I have to go back to something that struck me, and I think probably a lot of people in the room, I had to teach myself how to draw uh, in yeah. order to do this. In order to do this, you weren't just mm -hmm. already an artist who drew? I mean, you know, like, like anyone, uh, you know, I would doodle and sketch and what have you, but not really, um, not really uh, in a way that is useful for making a 250 page book so there's 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 you know uh, there's all kinds of skills that it's, it's worth learning and they are learnable skills don't let anyone tell you that you know you can either draw or you can't that's nonsense you can learn skills just like with science you can learn a lot of the skills needed to do wonderful things in science it's not some innate gift you either have or don't have so anyway I went off track there but it, it's an no, important that's it's an important, important, uh, important yeah. um, point. Um, so there are things that you, you really, it's worth learning in order to really have a range of expression and consistency and speed. It take, you, know, you need to be able to do thousands of drawings um, uh, and you need to be able to you know, draw 
a face that looks like a person that is a particular person from many different angles and uh, move people around a room and uh, uh, and uh, have them you know look reasonably expressive and things like that that takes uh, a lot of practice and you, you have to go away and learn it and and so basically I in 2010 or so I decided to start doing that and just uh, the main thing to do is just the best way to learn to draw is just draw and you draw and you draw and you draw and you practice and you practice and carry notebooks with me everywhere I go and every time I get an opportunity I do a sketch um, uh, and uh, do sketches of things, sketch faces, faces, bodies, everything and just you, you sort of start looking at the world in a different way. It's actually sort of That's fascinating. That's what I was going to get at. Yeah. Does your sort of obsession and, and um, you know the, just the sheer volume of time devoted to it. Did it change the way you think as a scientist? Did it change how you approach your research? Um, maybe. Uh, I mean, I've always been uh, very visual in the way I think about um, uh, sort of aspects of, of my research. There's, there's very much a lot of um, uh, sort of geom the kind of mathematics and things that I, I tend to bring to, to to problems can be uh, much more sort of uh, geometrical than algebraic sometimes and things M like that. Maybe we should dial and, back uh, and say what yeah. your research is. Do you want to? Ah, uh, yes. Make well, a I work on. Uh, thank you. I, I, so I work on um, uh, mixtures of particle physics um, uh, and uh, 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 gravity and quantum physics. So I tend to these days spend a lot of time thinking about um, approaches to understanding space and time at the most. Uh, basic level at the quantum level, so things like string theory and things like that, and apply them to black holes, cosmology, thing, uh, uh, those sorts of questions. Uh, we're still trying to understand what the best tools are for describing space and time at the quantum level. And uh, somehow all of that geometry Einstein taught us to think uh, breaks down in some way, uh, and uh, 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 the key tools for describing how that works and what takes over is, 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 a, is, a, is an issue of uh, uh, intense research. It, it, it relates to some of the exciting work that's going on with colliding black holes now. We may have new probes of some of those ideas going on in the heavens, as it were. So, so, but I'm on the theory side where I push equations around the page and draw diagrams and try and calculate things. So, so, so going back to the um, to your question, um, yes, I, 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 it's being able to. Uh, uh, feel free to sort of sketch even a cartoon of an idea is something we do in our field a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so there's a natural outgrowth of that to maybe wanting to sort of do sketching yeah. uh, in general. Yeah. Well, I got the book this afternoon with the hope of uh, at least getting a sense of what the different conversations were, only to discover that your chapters don't have titles. <laughs> and, uh, and I was, uh, I know, so much for my cheating. Um, and, uh, but I was curious about that, because that obviously is a very deliberate choice. They just have uh, one, numbers and, uh, and, and lovely graphical depictions of those numbers. That's going to hit the floor. Um, so uh, there are 11 of them. And are they divided into different topics, or are they... So, um, just sort of not really experiences more uh, than topics. Experiences, or? right? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a really great question. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed the the whole depiction of a conversation using conversation as the delivery um, for for a number of reasons. But um, one of them, for sure, is that there isn't a specific topic. Typically when you're having a conversation, there isn't sort of a, a big heading saying, you're now talking about subject X, right? You may start off talking about subject X, um, but you're gonna go off into different areas, or, or you started in some completely different place, and then uh, uh, you know, weeks later you realize that conversation was really about that other topic, or, or not about any particular topic at all. And that sounds very vague, but it's deliberate because science is very interconnected. And this is a great way of showing, without actually just having a big saying science is interconnected, I can just show you through a conversation that you can go from, uh, so the first chapter, sort of as a, a wink to the, the, the famous genre that people always associate with graphic books, um, uh, the superhero genre, you open it up and it looks like there's a bunch of superheroes in a, in a situation, but actually they're at a costume party, spoiler. <laughs> um, uh, and so they start talking about the whole superhero thing, 
But by the end of the chapter, they're talking about Maxwell's equations and why the speed of light is the speed of light and what that means and the nature of time and so on and so forth. So the point is, is that um, there isn't a specific topic in any chapter. You'll get a whole bunch of things. And then one of the things that I should mention um, is that uh, at the end of every chapter, uh, there are some detailed notes. There's two pages of notes that go, uh, you know, maybe on page 15, you saw that idea. It was, they sort of mentioned it. They didn't dwell on it because it's not meant to be a lecture. Um, so uh, on page 15, you saw that idea. Here's a really awesome book you can go away and read to find out more. Or here's a website with lots of stuff or what have you. So the idea is, is that there's some notes. This, the, the, a lot of, there'll be a taster of lots of concepts. And then you can go away and find out more. So it's, it's a little idi idiosyncratic guide uh, to the literature at the end of every chapter that will help you find some, some topics in physics and astronomy mm -hmm. that, that uh, you can find out more. So this is a way into some of the things you were talking about with uh, the, the very fabric of space and time and where uh, Einstein's ideas break down. That's right. the things in your research and more. And more. So this um, is a sort of a wonderful way to yeah, get can, into it. Yeah, you can just, if you like, ignore all the drawings and just cut to the end of every chapter <laughs> and, read, no. and read that. Um, <laughs> for those of you who just think this whole drawing thing, why do that? Words are just fine. Just go straight to those parts, and you'll find, yeah, you'll find stuff about read it resources about black holes and string theory, but you'll also find resources about the science of cooking. And um, uh, uh, I think about uh, the science of dishwashing. Yeah, uh, science all the time. of dishwashing. I didn't have anything I about do. that. Because it's all interconnected. There's a, there's a there's a there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's there's a number of cooking references. There's an entire story about cooking. Uh, and there's a point to it. There's a science point. Yeah, cooking is actually a great place to yeah. explore scientific ideas. Yeah. Um, my last question, then I'll open it up, is uh, are these all sort of invented whole cloth in your imagination, or do they stem from conversations you've either been a part of or overheard, or you know, was there, how, how did you select these various conversations? All of the above, um, in the sense that uh, uh, I I, I'm not trying to force upon people the idea that there are conversations happening about science out there in the real world. They're real conversations that, 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 that I hear. I, I, I people watch a lot, and uh, I, I'm on public transport, um, uh, and I listen to people talking about all kinds of things, and sometimes it's science. Um, sometimes uh, I run into people who've you know, seen me out there in the world or on a TV show, and they engage me about in science. Um, they said, you know, Laura Danley said that thing on TV the other day. <laughs> what do you think? And we can have a conversation because, you know, they may have been inspired by something that they saw you say or that I said. And then um, you either hear people talking about that or, or I get involved in those conversations. Yeah. So they really happen. There's no conversation in there that is entirely one of those conversations. But they're, they're, the style, the spirit of that kind of conversation is in some of those conversations. Uh, some of it I've, of course, made up completely. The characters are completely made up. Um, uh, the locations are mostly all real. Um, uh, uh, I, I, but they're also, like the chapter's not named. So you can sort of go in I and see you, whether you uh, recognize. You'll the recognize Natural some, History Museum. Yeah, then. you'll recognize <laughs> some places, but uh, uh, maybe you won't get them all. Um, and that's kind of fun. Or maybe you'll be in one of those places another time, and then you go, wait a minute, this is familiar, um, and so on and so forth. So it's all, it's a mixture, uh, but hopefully meant to be in the spirit of this wonderful thing that we can do as part of our culture, which is to have conversations about science. Well, with that, that's a great lead-in to open up the questions, even though I have more. Yes. Uh, congratulations on a very creative idea. I mean, Thank you. Um, I, I, my question is, could you send a copy of this book to the American Dyslexic uh, Society? Uh, I, I'm told that dyslexics are people that, with brains that think in three dimensions. And with, for us, uh, think in 2D, reading is a, you know, an easy skill. But, I, but perhaps dyslexics are far more advanced than we are, and, mm -hmm. and it, uh, my question is, would you send a copy to the 
you know, maybe maybe the dyslexics of the world would really appreciate your book. Uh, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah. uh, if, if, do you perhaps know uh, well, good contact information? Or? <laughs> okay, all right. No, I thought I thought maybe you knew a, a I'm person. Not, I'm, not as, <laughs> I'm not an expert on dyslexia. Right, right. But, I, I, uh, I, I would love to do that <laughs> if, if, uh, if, if, you know, if it was any, if, if it was of any interest or, uh, to them uh, 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 and uh, 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 service I could do, of course, I would. Thank you. Yes, here. Hi. Uh, so science communication is actually one of those very complex issues that people tend to not address at all. And I'm very happy that you're not only researching it, or researching, but also getting engaged in the whole science communication endeavor. My question is, after writing this book, since you said it took 18 years before, from the inception of the idea to completion, essentially, eight years. Sorry. No, 18. 18. Oh, 18. See, I was listening. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's <laughs> Nothing takes that long these days. You know, <laughs> that, that day. <laughs> so I'm assuming throughout the process you, had, you have always had engaged into science communication. After yeah. writing this, have you noticed that your approach to science communication has become more visual? So instead of having a conversation at a bus stop, you would say, well, hold on, let me show you, and you pull out a paper and draw the diagram. Um, no, uh, that's a good question um, because uh, because visual can mean more than drawing a diagram, and so I I can have a conversation with you about um, some aspect of physics, some astro, uh, aspect of astrophysics, and be very visual, but use words to invoke you know at a bus stop use words to invoke that. Um, so 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 I you know I've always done that, and I, I think I've. Uh, um, Learned a lot about how to do that, and some of that, um, you know, went into the book. Um, um, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only mode. Uh, but it certainly adds to the kind of things that I do. Or I might actually think of something in my head that's, you know, in a way coming from a drawing or something. But then it helps guide what I might then say in words. It, it really depends upon the situation. I, 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 it's not clear to me that um, people would stay around uh, much if I if I stopped <laughs> and got out the notebook and started uh, scribbling. <laughs> Although sometimes I have the notebook out ar already because I'm sitting on the subway and I'm actually sketching some of the people around me. Um, but then I'm usually not showing it to anyone, so I don't <laughs> start a fight or something. <laughs> I, w I was struck at the beginning. It's very commonplace in observatories uh, to you know, uh, and I'm thinking of, of right now Green Bank, West Virginia. Uh, where you go have lunch, and the classic write on a napkin, Mike, well, you sketch that mm -hmm. on a napkin, is absolutely true. Yeah. So uh, people are always pulling out their pens and writing on napkins. Yeah. So they actually have little slips of paper, little pads yeah. of paper and pencils, because they know That's that great. scientists sitting around a table are eventually going to start drawing <laughs> things. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very common way to communicate. Yeah. Yes? Was this book a very linear process for you, as in like you had the ideas, you would finish one chapter and then move on to the next, or was over time did you have to go back and make a lot of revisions just because of what was going on in the scientific community or your own revelations in your own research? Well, the book isn't, um, uh, uh, so that's a great question. Um, the book is, uh, so again, another thing that's very common in um, the business of doing a popular level book by someone who does research is that they, the, it's all about sort of here's the latest thing that's going on in my field and that's kind of the book. There might be some early chapters that sort of say well here's what you need to know before and then chapter you know so my, my joke of that is that the standard model of that book is that there are 10 chapters introducing you to a little bit of relativity, a little bit of this, and then chapter 11 is here's what I want to work tell you about really. So this isn't that kind of book either. So while there is some string theory and quantum gravity in there, it, w it wasn't really my goal to, to tell you the latest stuff that's going on, although there is some of that. Um, I really just wanted to celebrate some of the great things that are, 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 are um, uh, worth talking about, about science. And so, so the chapter, you know, there's two chapters, which is mostly, uh, like I said, it's about lots of things, but it's mostly about Maxwell's equations, which are, as you may know, um, uh, well over 100 years old. They were the, the, you know, um, discovered uh, 
the equations that eventually taught us what light really is and all electromagnetic phenomena. They're regarded by some as the most beautiful equations mm. uh, uh, ever written down, um, uh, you know, in the context of physics. Um, it's kind of fun to unpack what people mean when they say that. So there's a character who's, you know, one, one character says, oh, th those equations are so beautiful, and the other one says, what, what does that mean? Right, you're talking about math here, right? Th what's that mean, beautiful? I don't think beautiful. And so they have this conversation about why that is, is, a, is a meaningful thing, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So that's not telling you anything about latest research, um, it would seem, but actually it can, because a lot of what we're doing right now in research is a lot of it is driven by trying to write down um, a very symmetric, beautiful equations that maybe capture a range of phenomena in certain ways because experience has taught us that that's usually a good thing to do. So uh, if I just started talking about the latest stuff, I don't necessarily get to tell you about some of the stuff that drives us to do some of that latest stuff. So it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of book in that I'm not necessarily always telling you the latest news. Um, uh, I'm really sort of just grabbing some very interesting and intriguing aspects of how we do research um, as well as some of the uh, products of it. But like I said, I'm also just celebrating science. So there's, a, there's an entire story which is just about cooking rice. <laughs> and uh, actually, it, it, if, you, if, you, if you step back and think what it's really about, it's about the process of actually doing science. Um, I'll leave you to discover that. In terms of the structure of the stories and stuff like that, no, it was, it was not linear. Um, I, I wrote some things, I wrote some stories, I, I, I designed some characters, I, I chose some settings, um, and there was a lot of sort of looseness. So I let some things flow until I sort of figured out structurally what I was doing. Um, and I had a lot of material. I probably had material for four, a 400 page book, and then at some point I, I, I sat down and, and then said, I, I'm going to now figure out what the order of these stories are, how they intersect. I thought it'd be nice to have the stories intersect in some way. So they're standalone stories, but they also intersect. Some characters from one end up in another, and, or maybe they don't, depends upon how you read it, and so on and so <laughs> forth. So it was very nonlinear, is, is, the, is the much shorter uh, <laughs> answer. <laughs> so in 18 years, we're going to have more dialogues. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, oh boy. Um, up there, the top, and then you, and then you, and then I have a couple questions, and then we have to end. Uh -huh. Yeah. Given, given the uh, type of book you're writing, it's rather unique. The, you know, pictures and physics, and you don't see that too often. How did your publisher <laughs> handle editing this thing? Uh, well, um, uh, to, well, there's a pre-question to that, which is how did I get this thing published in the first place? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, because basically, uh, so the main thing I learned, you know, you, uh, sort of ten years of. Uh, almost 10 years of teaching myself, uh, you know, raising my level of drawing and all of that sort of teaching myself and learning about the craft of making graphic novels and what have you. The most important lesson I learned is that you never go into a publisher and say, I have an original idea. <laughs> no one's ever done this. And there's nothing out there like this. Please publish this. So it's the last thing they want to hear, unfortunately. Uh, publishers want to hear, I have a book idea, here's five other books that are kind of exactly the same, and here are their sales figures, and I'm going to do one more. That's what they really want to hear, so, yeah. So, uh, so needless to say, um, uh, uh, this uh, took up a huge amount of time trying to get it published. Um, so that's a longer story. The, the real question you asked then is, once I did find a publisher, um, uh, uh, what was it like for them to edit it? Well, basically, they were not allowed to edit it. Part of the deal was that this, from, from, uh, from the cover, uh, the front cover right through to the back, uh, is all me. And um, so I, I, I just, I, 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 it, uh, maybe I'm a little bit of a control freak, but it really is, um, <laughs> it, really, it, it really is that the project, is, the project is, is unique. It was very, very difficult because, again, I couldn't point to examples. It's very, very difficult to me, for me to explain um, what it is I was trying to do in certain ways, including the design of the book itself. And so the best way to do it was just to do it. And, and they were very kind. MIT Press were, were, were very excited about what I was doing. And they pretty much uh, stepped aside and let me, and let me just hand them a camera-ready uh, document. Um, uh, I wasn't expecting them to allow me to do the cover. I thought, OK, they're gonna, they, they can do the cover. That's, uh, and then at some point, 
uh, I was sort of secretly hoping at some point an email came and said, so we were thinking, would you mind doing the cover? And I said, yes! <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so I, got, I got to do uh, absolutely everything. But, but there, were, there were points where they came back and said, you know, uh, we're not quite sure what's going on here. This isn't how this is normally done with this aspect. And I said, well, here's... And then some people were very patient and, and, and sort of listened when I tried to explain uh, what I was trying to do. Uh, in, in certain aspects of the design. Um, I think actually a larger, more fancy publisher in New York um, may, may not have been as accommodating. So in a way, maybe it was a good thing I ended up at a small academic publisher. Sounds like there was a lot of trust and respect. Yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, being both an artist and a scientist, do you ever struggle with um, being able to balance your two interests, like finding time to do both? <laughs> Um, I think of myself as a, a scientist who's um, just got um, certain uh, skills that I use to communicate um, uh, maybe a little a little broader skill set than than is than is traditional. But I don't really think of myself as an artist. I I I I, I can't even describe myself. It, it feels like I'm. <laughs> I, it feels like I, I'm uh, 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 intruding on uh, on on on, on uh, you know the, the real professionals' turf. So so I tend not to think of myself in that way. So it it, it is still, as far as I'm concerned, part of the scientific enterprise, uh, the business of, of communicating it. And I feel that my drawing uh, work and, and artwork is is all in service of that. So. Um, but yeah, in terms of finding time, it's still an issue. Even though I don't call myself an artist and I don't necessarily um, uh, have any sort of formal art training, um, it, it certainly can take a lot of time. And uh, I just decided at some point that it, it's worth it. I think it's important to communicate um, effectively and, and to get people excited about science. I think it, it's, it, it's not just important in some abstract sense, it's, it's vitally important for society. And this, this is something I can do uh, to help. So that's what I do. And last question there. Uh, quick comment. I used to teach at Art Center College of Design, and we called drawing visual communication. And it, yeah. it's fantastic that way. But my question was, it looks to me like you're, you're trying to share how good it feels to talk about physics and picture it. It's almost like listening to music the two people are sharing. You know, the, the ideas make your brain go places and, and, and experience things. And, you know, you're, when you look at it inside your head and move it around and check it out, that feels great. That's fun. It's like listening to music. Is that kind of the joy you're trying to convey in That's this conversation? That's part of it, yeah. It, it, it's, uh uh, science is an awesome thing that we do as a, as a species, and uh, I, I think it's important to share that and to, to, to help everyone realize that it belongs to everyone. It doesn't belong to us scientists. Um, uh, and uh, and it's, a, it's just a great thing. It's, it's a great way of seeing the world. It's not the only way to see the world, um, but it's one of the ways that everyone should have access to. And, and, and just the joy of, of sharing it in conversation and all of that is something I want to celebrate uh, a, a, a bit more. So thank, thanks for that thought. Um, I will ask the last question, and that is actually tied to your question about do you have time for all that? Because not only is he a full professor, teaching, physicist, book author, uh, also spectacular organic gardener, uh, <laughs> true. And a uh, newly, somewhat new father. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't help noticing in your signature file that you also are a co founder of something called the Los Angeles Institute for the oh, Humanities. Right. Yeah. And I have been wanting to ask you, what is that? Co director, not, not, co not co founder. Oh, um, uh, yes. No, 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 that's, that's fine. I just I wouldn't want uh, the, the, the visionaries who, who, who came up with it uh, to, be, to be forgotten, uh, to, be, to, 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 yeah, to be not be acknowledged. Um, uh, the Los Angeles Institute of Humanities, some of you may have encountered it uh, knowingly or, or unknowingly. It's, if you imagine um, uh, a gathering every, every so often, every couple of weeks, um, of some of the city's finest thinkers in, in a variety of fields, 
um, uh, whether they be uh, writers of fiction or nonfiction, whether they be musicians, um, journalists, historians, a few scientists, uh, so on and so forth, uh, artists, um, just getting together and sharing ideas, uh, telling each other about their latest projects and maybe, maybe uh, 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 giving each other um, uh, um, suggestions or, or making connections and what have you. So it, that, that's roughly what it is in, 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 in its essence, but then there are a lot of projects that um, uh, sort of began sometimes over those luncheons that became things that are parts of uh, um, uh, the, the, the culture of Los Angeles. Um, among the most famous are the Los Angeles Review of Books, which is now one of the most amazing um, uh, uh, websites, and they also uh, 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 publish things in print, um, places that celebrating the written word in all its form. Uh, some of the founders of LARB, as it's called, um, are regulars at the Los Angeles Review of um, Sorry, Los Angeles Institute for Humanities. Um, you will find uh, during the Los Angeles Festival, the Los Angeles Time Festival of Books, which happens in April, which is the largest book festival in North America, happening down on the USC campus. You will find a ton of our fellows um, taking part in all the various panels that you might go uh, and conversations. So, so a, a lot of writers that you might love who who who. Uh, resident in Los Angeles may be uh, part of that group. And so it, it, w it's, it's, it's just a way of collecting together a lot of that amazing uh, uh, cultural yeah. force that's in the city, in a city that's often regarded as being without culture. That's what I was thinking, um, isn't that crazy? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, so, and so we meet, so, so, so we meet every couple of weeks uh, during, during the sort of semester, uh, uh, the f spring and fall semester. And um, we also do, uh, since I became co-director a few years ago, I try and get us to engage more with the city by going out there as well. So we're not just sort of meeting, having luncheons, which you can be a, a friend of the LA, LAIH and, and, and come to the luncheons. Um, um, but we'll also, we also go out there in the world uh, of LA. So we might have um, a, a, a luncheon at, uh, you know, maybe the Griffith Observatory one day, um, or, um, or the Getty Center, or the Los Angeles River Center, yeah. or um, we're, we're doing uh, something down at Union Station in a few weeks. So it, it really is, we're, we're really engaged with the city. And we try mostly covertly, mostly tacitly, um, uh, uh, help with a lot of the, 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 the cultural life of the city in various ways. Wonderful. Well, uh, we are going to wrap up this uh, first half of the show by having Tony come up in a moment to do the Sky Report. Um, I will show you the book again because I know you're <laughs> going to want to rush out during break time, purchase it, and get uh, Clifford to yeah, sign it for happy you. To sign up so uh, let's thank Clifford uh, once again. And <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> but we will need to go over to uh, back to the other computer. Oh, right. um, he does that up there. You All don't right. need to do All anything. Right. This down so it's not distracting. And uh, so let's. So what's um, in the sky for the coming month? Let's see. There's no eclipse we can see from here, so I don't know. There's not a lot going on. Well, <laughs> one thing um, is we see in the evening sky. Currently, there are no bright planets visible right after sunset, but that will change. And uh, at the end of the month, we can go on ahead here, uh, the planet Venus will reappear in the evening sky, and then it will be visible for about eight months. And we'll, it'll be hard to see this month, but it will get higher and higher, and in about three or four months, it'll be the you know most eye-catching thing that you see in the evening sky. Um, as uh, Dr. Danley mentioned, <laughs> Lauren <laughs> mentioned, uh, January uh, robbed us of the first, you know, the full moon the day before February. March will also have a blue moon, and that's also rare to have hmm. two blue moons and you know, separated by a month. But February, the short month, was left with no full moon at all. However, you'll notice on the 15th there is a new moon, <laughs> and. Um, Whenever there's a lunar eclipse, there's always a solar eclipse two weeks away. So uh, there will be a solar eclipse, but if you don't have your travel plans already <laughs> secure, you won't see this one. This one is 
uh, maximum in Antarctica, where 59% of the sun will be seen. So you can join the emperor of penguins. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it might come up again. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> so that, and that's astronomically correct. Astronomically Tony made it himself. correct. Yes. I didn't make the penguins. All right. <laughs> anyway, um, all the planets that are visible now uh, are visible in the morning sky. And if you look to the southeast, uh, we'll see Jupiter, the brightest of the planets currently visible. Here's a recent image uh, showing the uh, red spot. <coughs> Mars um, is very tiny now, but uh, expert astrophotographers are getting beautiful images. This is by Damien Peach, who uh, is England's probably finest planetary uh, <coughs> photographer. And you can see a lot of clouds already on Mars. Um, <coughs> Mars will be five times bigger when it's close to us in the end of July, so it'll be something we can all enjoy then. And uh, Saturn is also low in the southeast. And over the next few mornings, uh, starting February 7th, when the quarter, last quarter moon is near Jupiter, um, every couple of mornings it'll pass by another planet. So notice Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn. So here on the 9th it's by Mars, and on the 11th it's right above Saturn. And that's the big event of the month. <laughs> it's then, a short month. And then, of course, every, you know, every night here except Monday, we have telescopes uh, for you to look through. And I especially would encourage you to come to one of our uh, public star parties. And uh, there's one coming up on the 24th. Um, this is where the astronomy clubs bring uh, about you know 20 or 30 telescopes in addition to the three or four that we set up on the lawn and our venerable Zeiss refractor on the roof. So I hope to see you at one of these events. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so I, uh, we, in a moment we're going to dim the lights and uh, look at our pretty picture uh, end of the first half. Um, I would invite all of you when we take our break, which I mentioned would be a little longer this time, so you can go buy a book. <laughs> Did I mention buy a book? Um, then, uh, uh, um, right. Then uh, um, in the second half, we have a bunch of new exciting stuff from Mars, more on the California drought, which we may have to start talking about again. Um, and uh, a wonderful uh, vi oddball visitor from another uh, solar system part two story, and of course our, um, our Golden Griffiths Awards uh, nomination. So um, we hope you'll come back. Uh, I'd like to say goodbye to our live stream audience because we are about to end our stream. Um, and if you <laughs> and uh, if you uh, come to Los Angeles and see you're far away, um, please do come to Griffith Observatory. We'd love to have you up here. Uh, come on the first Friday of the month and come to All Space Considered. So thank you to the live stream audience. Goodbye to you. And uh, let's dim the lights and we'll move on to pretty pictures.